from the Reynolds Journalism Institute at the Missouri School of Journalism. This is Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. 64 years ago, a ceasefire brought a halt to the Korean War and left Korea divided. More than 36,000 Americans were killed in the three-year conflict, along with more than 2 million soldiers and civilians from North and South Korea and an estimated 600,000 Chinese soldiers. But in recent weeks, the frozen conflict on the Korean Peninsula threatened to re-erupt over the North's nuclear weapons program. President Trump threatened North Korea famously with fire and fury, and the North's Kim Jong-il countered with a plan to envelop the U.S. territory of Guam with a fire of missiles. Now, for the moment, the rhetoric between the two sides has eased, but the showdown has tested the credibility of both leaders and raised anew the prospect of nuclear war in East Asia. On this edition of Global Journalist, we're going to look at how such a war might come about and how a st more stable ceasefire or peace could even be achieved. Now, to kick things off, we're going to bring in Ankit Panda in New York. He's a senior editor at The Diplomat, a magazine focusing on Asian foreign policy issues. Ankit, welcome. Thank you for having me. Well, give here. us it's a pleasure to have you. Give us just a, a quick update as to what uh, what's happened just in the past day or so here. What's the current status of this standoff? Sure. So the current status um, is widely being reported as uh, Kim Jong-un in North Korea having walked down his threat to uh, envelop Guam with, uh, with a striking fire. Um, but, you know, it, this really goes back to the threat that he made last week, which was, um, again, misinterpreted. Um, the threat was never that North Korea would carry out this launch, that the order would be given. The way that it was presented in North Korea state media uh, was actually a little bit more subtle. Uh, it was the it was the chief of North Korea's strategic rocket force, who uh, um, is uh, Kim rak -yum. He's another guy. He manages their missile program. He said that he would simply present a plan to Kim Jong-un on August 15th. But in the meantime, in the United States, uh, if you're kind of reading a lot of these reports, it seemed like the North Koreans were imminently counting down to a strike on Guam. Um, so um, as of August 15th, Kim Jong-un did review that plan. Um, but then we had a tweet yesterday from President Trump saying that uh, he had made a well-reasoned decision um, not to proceed with this uh, launch. But uh, that's still on the table. It could happen any day, and especially with the U.S.-South uh, Korea joint exercises kicking off in just a few days, um, it could be a possibility that we see a missile launch from North Korea, if not specifically a launch towards Guam, which would be the most provocative action that North Korea has really ever taken against the United States or one of its territories. Well, walk us back just a bit, if you would. You mentioned the military exercises between the U.S. and South Korea, which are about to take place, which I understand happen annually and are often uh, a moment of tension between the U.S. and North Korea. But but take us back in, in time uh, over the past couple of years. What has changed about the relationship between North Korea and the U.S.? Why does North Korea seem to be more threatening now? Sure. So I think um, what's going on with this Guam threat is Kim Jong-un looking at his new tools that he has in his toolkit. So uh, a new capability that North Korea acquired, um, I guess, beginning in May this year, was a missile capable of reliably striking Guam. They used to have another missile called the Musudan, which had a similar range that could have reached Guam, but they had some testing difficulties with that last year. So not only do they have this new missile that lets them hit Guam, but they also notably tested their first intercontinental range ballistic missile, which is a missile that is uh, widely assessed to be capable of striking the U.S. homeland. And I think these opened up a few new opportunities for the kinds of things that Kim Jong-un can practice when it comes to extracting concessions from the United States, attempting to bargain with the Trump administration that weren't available to him before. Um, so those are, I would say, the two major changes. With regard to the exercises, they've been a perpetual uh, source of concern for the North Korean regime. They uh, not only regard the Ulchi Freedom Guardian exercise, which is the one that's about to kick off in a few days, but also the Key Resolve and Full Eagle exercises, which the United States and South Korea hold earlier in the year, as effectively a ruse for a preemptive war. They repeatedly refer to it as such. And um, they are really looking for ways to force the United States and South Korea to modify this. But in terms of the development of these missile capabilities, then, how does that change sort of the dynamic of negotiations or potential negotiations between the two countries? Does it, does it weaken the U.S.'s hands significantly? 
The important new capability here is that uh, we are in an era where North Korea can strike the U.S. homeland. And I think uh, that affects the options that are now available to the United States. Um, obviously, uh, since the end of the Korean War, we haven't seen a resumption of total warfare on the Korean Peninsula. And that's due to a variety of reasons, uh, if not a long-range missile being able to strike the U.S. homeland. North Korea has long had a large biological and chemical weapons uh, stockpile. They've been able to strike Seoul, a city, a metropolitan area of 24 million people with artillery and uh, other other short-range rockets, um, and those have been sufficient to prevent escalation. But now with the ability to strike the U.S. homeland, not only do we have new challenges to the U.S.-South Korea alliance, but uh, you know the United States just simply cannot entertain certain kinds of military options as confidently anymore, in my view, um, simply because we have no assurance that we can eliminate all of their ICBMs before they could strike us with a nuclear weapon. Well, there has been, uh, and obviously this is a disturbing new era where you have uh, another country that could potentially hit the U.S. mainland with a nuclear missile. Um, but there has been talk of sort of a preemptive U.S. strike on North Korea over the development of a weapons program by the South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham and some others in Washington. You've written a piece in The Atlantic arguing against this. Why, why do you think that's a bad idea? Sure. So uh, the reasons for that uh, have to do with just my belief that our intelligence is not sufficient to reduce the risk of such an attack. And what I mean by that is that North Korea has road mobile long range missiles that are capable of striking the United States. In order for such a preemptive attack to be viable and to be worth the risk, in my opinion, the United States would have to have utmost confidence that it could eliminate every single one of North Korea's missiles and um, ensure that it could not retaliate against the U.S. homeland. And more broadly, I think the, you know, we're at a point where any war with North Korea immediately becomes a nuclear war. Um, it's not just the ICBMs. They are now assessed by the United States intelligence community unanimously to be able to make compact nuclear warheads that they can stick on a range of missiles that are able to strike Tokyo and Seoul. Um, the costs of, I think, living with a nuclear North Korea are significantly lower than the cost of any new war or conflict um, either over preemption or prevention, which uh, no longer makes sense because what we've been seeking to prevent has already happened. And do you see that the Trump administration has sort of a clear strategy for how it's going to go forward? I don't. Um, the administration hasn't been reading from one book on North Korea policy. Uh, and especially in the past month after these uh, long range missile tests, we haven't really heard one clear statement. I think what I'm mentally working with now as the clearest statement of policy from the Trump administration is a recent op-ed article by Secretary Tillerson and Secretary Mattis that outlined a range of options. And most notably, it um, opened up a possibility for talks with North Korea for a secession of missile tests, which is an important modification of what the United States used to ask in the past, which was a bona fide gesture by North Korea towards denuclearization. So I think it, it, um, it reflects a softening of that position and could be something that North Korea has now gained by uh, demonstrating its new capabilities. And Anki Panda, our time does grow short, but very quickly, what do we know with confidence about North Korea's nuclear program? And what are some of the things that may be important things that we don't know? Sure. Um, one of the things we don't know, I would say, is the number of missiles that they have and these long range capabilities. And I think that does matter for some of these arguments about preemption and prevention. What we do know and what I'm not willing to bet against uh, is their ability to today strike the U.S. homeland with an intercontinental range ballistic missile that can carry a nuclear weapon to uh, at least Los Angeles, maybe Chicago, maybe even Washington or New York. Uh, so I'm not willing to bet against North Korea's um, missile capabilities, even though there is other skepticism that they simply need to refine a few of these um, elements that are involved in making such a missile work. Anki Panda, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. A reminder that this is Global Journalist. On today's show, we're taking a close look at the standoff on the Korean Peninsula. North Korea's Kim Jong-un appears to have accelerated the country's nuclear weapons program, a move that's led to UN sanctions and some heated comments from U.S. President Donald Trump. And we just heard from Ankit Panda of The Diplomat. To continue our discussion, we're going to bring in three other experts who have been following the developments over the past month closely. Joining us from Santa Monica, California, is Bruce Bennett, a senior defense analyst with the RAND Corp. In Washington, D.C., is Harry Kazianis. He's the director of defense studies at the Center for the National Interest. Also in Washington is Joshua Pollock. He's the editor of the Non-Proliferation Review at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies. Welcome to all of you. Bruce Bennett, let me start with you. Welcome to the program, first of all. Tell us just a little bit about the significance of the sanctions that were passed at the UN Security Council just last month. 
Well, so the new sanctions are intended to really tighten the grip around North Korea, uh, in particular to cut out their ability to earn hard currency by which they can obtain outside goods which are necessary for sustaining the regime with its elites. So that's the nature of the activity, is gradually tighten, trying to tighten the grip around the elites. But North Korea has done in the past a pretty good job of working around those kinds of sanctions. It's hard to tell how well those will go, especially since China has been inconsistent in its implementation of the sanctions. Um, don't know for sure what's going to happen with these. Well, Harry Kazianis, I'll let you jump in on this then. Talk to us about China's role in this. It is North Korea's major trading partner. Of course, back during the Korean War, it was its military ally, but the, the nature of their relationship and China's interests has changed, obviously. Tell us about that. Sure. I mean, I always, one thing I always do when I try to understand the Chinese opinion and viewpoint of North Korea is ping some of my Chinese colleagues in Beijing and Chinese officials I've worked with, the track twos and others. And what they've said about North Korea has been pretty consistent for at least for me the last four or five years. They aren't very happy that the North Koreans have nuclear weapons. It's not a reality that they want to face. But what the Chinese consistently have said is that, look, we don't like the status quo when it comes to North Korean nuclear weapons. But at the same time, the alternatives are far worse. And one thing they always consistently say to me time and time again is that they're afraid that if they really put the squeeze on North Korea, if, for example, they really enforced to the letter of the law UN Security Council resolutions, that they would push the North Koreans over some sort of tipping point. And what my, old, what my Chinese colleagues always tell me is, look, we don't want to start a situation where the regime ends up collapsing or there's some sort of situation where some sort of player in the North Korean military or some officer corps or something decides to take Kim Jong-un out. And then you have a situation where there's a North Korean civil war where you have different factions slinging nuclear weapons at each other or you know, launching chemical weapons at each other. So the Chinese are probably actually more afraid of, of North Korea than we are. So when we talk about sanctions, I think this time the Chinese will actually enforce the sanctions. In fact, there was reports just yesterday that broke that there was some sort of rough housing on, on some of the bridges that go into North Korea across from China because Chinese merchants were very upset that they couldn't get their goods out of North Korea to sell in China. So there is a possibility the Trump administration might have a breakthrough, but it's very interesting to see how far the Chinese are willing to go because they have these fears. Well, Joshua Pollock, tell us if you would, if you are North Korea, if you could put yourselves in their shoes, what are some of the practical reasons for having a nuclear program, for engaging in this sort of like tense nuclear standoff with the U.S.? I mean, you could easily argue, I think, that the U.S. wouldn't even pay attention to North Korea if it didn't have a nuclear program. Perhaps. Uh, I see at least two reasons why the North Koreans uh, want nuclear weapons. The first is uh, to defend themselves against uh, a superior adversary. The uh, combined exercises with the South Koreans certainly have their attention, but the standing presence of U.S. armed forces in Korea is, is an enduring problem for them. They look at Iraq, they look at Libya, they look at Afghanistan, Serbia, and they see the United States uh, bringing superior force to bear on its enemies. They, they've uh, made very clear that nuclear weapons on short and medium range missiles are how they plan to counteract that. And if American forces build up in the region, instead of sitting and waiting for it, like the Iraqis did on a couple of occasions, uh, they've said that they will attack at that time. The other reason, I believe, is to raise the risks of the confrontation in order to change American attitudes over the long term. The North Koreans complain of an American hostile policy. This includes sanctions. It includes military encirclement, uh, uh, denunciation of the country on human rights grounds, and so forth. Uh, they would like us to distance ourselves from our defense commitment to South Korea, uh, pack up and go home eventually. And that, I think, is where the ICBMs come in. Well, Bruce Bennett, if I could turn this to you. I spoke with a Japanese journalist this week. I also saw an interview with a South Korean journalist. And what struck me uh, from both of them or both of their perspectives was that people in South Korea, people in Japan just didn't seem to be as sort of impressed by the developments over the past month as Americans are. What, what are Japan, what are South Korea's interests here? 
Well, South Koreans, many of them have felt like the North Korean threat has been there for decades. Nothing's ever really seriously come of it, a little bit, but not, not really a serious attack. And so they tend to be dismissive of the ups and downs. But if you go to the security community, I think the South Korean security community is very concerned at this current point in time. They're worried that North Korea is trying to decouple the United States from South Korea the way that it was able to decouple, the, the way that the Soviets were able to decouple France from NATO in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, and South Korea worries about that. That is something that would cause them a significant increase in threat. Uh, Japanese so in other words, what you're saying then is that this nuclear program is an effort to get the U.S. to sort of pull its fo forces out of South Korea, which is actually something that I believe President Trump spoke about during the campaign, and leave South Korea sort of on its own to defend itself. And, and to go a step further, North Korea has never renounced the option of invading South Korea and unifying Korea under North Korean control. If the U.S. were to pull out, within 10 years, the South Korean army will be not much more than half the size it is today because of demographic problems. And so they have a prospect in that kind of case if they're prepared to use WMD and if uh, weapons of mass destruction and if the United States is not in a position to really go back into Korea to rescue the South Koreans. Well, Harry Kazianis, Bruce Bennett was just mentioning WMD, and of course that will remind many of our listeners of the war in Iraq. What, uh, If you look at just sort of this issue of, of halting proliferation or these types of threats, we have the experience of Iran under the Obama administration, the nuclear agreement signed there, and then of course the Iraq war. Are there lessons from those crises that are applicable here? Well, I, I think broadly. I mean, I, I think there's to sort of piggyback on your question, I think there's a, a bigger question in mind. What is the United States willing to risk as other countries decide to acquire nuclear weapons? I mean, you know, we had the case of Iraq where we thought the Iraqis might have had weapons of mass destruction. We ended up being woefully wrong in that scenario as we got the intelligence wrong. Um, obviously, in North Korea, it's pretty clear they have nuclear weapons. They ha they are developing intercontinental ballistic missiles to hit the U.S. homeland. And as Ankit you know, skillfully noted, that takes away our range of options. But what do we do in the years ahead as, I think, inevitably other countries you know, in history, as far as we want to go in the future, are probably going to decide to get nuclear weapons? I think the United States needs to figure out what its strategy is going to be what it's going to risk, and, and what sorts of sets of options we're willing to take as other countries go down this road. Keep in mind, you know, we can say whatever we want about the Iran nuclear deal. Within 10 to 12 years, that deal will expire. And we don't really know what the dynamics between, you know, Washington and Tehran will be at the time, what type of administration is going to come into office. So would the United States think about some sort of preemptive strike if you know, Iran was thinking about developing its nuclear program again. Um, you know, the Iranians are already working on long-range missiles. You know, what, I think we really need to have a conversation in this country about what are we going to do when adversaries that are, aren't to our liking want to build these weapons. Because these problems and these questions, they're going to come up again. It's inevitable. A reminder that you're listening to Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. We're talking today about North Korea's nuclear program and the threat it poses to East Asian countries and the U.S. We're joined by Bruce Bennett of the RAND Corp., Harry Kazianis of the Center for the National Interest, and Joshua Pollock of the Middlebury Institute of International Studies. If you're interested in more Global Journalists, visit our website, globaljournalist.org. You can also connect with us on Facebook and Twitter, or subscribe to the videocast of this program on YouTube. And Joshua Pollock, if I might, I wanted to ask you uh, about a bit about the state of dialogue right now between the U.S. and North Korea. Uh, many of our listeners will recall that the American student, uh, Otto Warmbier, who had been in North Korean custody, was sent home severely injured and, and, and died earlier this year as a result of um, injuries that uh, occurred to him in North Korea. How has this affected sort of the efforts to have some discussions, some talks about what's going on? Well, uh, the return of Otto Warmbier um, and, and its very sad outcome um, uh, was the result of the one channel for dialogue that the United States and North Korea currently seem to have which is through uh, North Korea's UN office in New York City. 
Uh, this so-called New York channel has been the primary uh, avenue of communications between the two countries for some years now. It used to be the case that our militaries would speak to each other uh, in a building at Panmunjom uh, at the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea. But the North Koreans pulled out of that arrangement uh, a few years ago. That strikes me as a problem. There really are two tracks we could think about here. One is a diplomatic track but the other is a military to military track that could be used now for crisis management. The lack of an effective crisis management mechanism, I think, is troubling if you're going to have two countries with nuclear weapons aimed at each other. This is why the United States and the Soviet Union created a hotline after the Cuban Missile Crisis. And that is probably, at least in my view, the most urgent need uh, that the two sides have of each other at this time. And Harry Kazianis, if I could turn this to you, then what's what's your take on this? And also, you know, what what might a future uh, a future negotiation look like? Are we at the point where there can still be some sort of like give and take? You give up some nuclear weapons, we'll lift some sanctions as you had, or some nuclear material as we had in the Iran deal, or does some sort of future agreement with North Korea have to look quite different? Well, like Winston Churchill said, it's always better to jaw jaw than a war war. So I, I think negotiation is the way to go in this situation. And, and look, I agree with Joshua's point. I, I think there has to be some sort of dialogue. There needs to be some sort of mechanism. So if we are into, into enter some sort of crisis situation, we have a mechanism to talk and not through you know, Donald Trump tweeting or Kim Jong-un going through you know, North Korean news media or something like that. Unfortunately, I think for the short to medium term, I don't see any prospects of talks. Um, I, I've been polling some of my White House contacts over the last couple of days. Those folks don't seem very optimistic. My own assessment, and this is just my own take, is that you know when you have three Americans that are essentially being held hostage in North Korea, you have the death of Otto Wambier that is under very, very murky circumstances. Um, you know, we haven't really had a full accounting of ha what happened. I, I think it's very hard for the Trump administration to sort of make that leap of faith, considering some of the comments that, that the president has made over the last couple weeks and months. And then you have the, the North Koreans. I don't think really at the moment they have any incentive to negotiate. Keep in mind, they're still trying to make those final touches on their nuclear program with the specific capability to hit the U.S. homeland. Why would they want to negotiate anything away when they haven't fully gained all of those capabilities? Now, I think they can hit the U.S. with a nuclear weapon, but I think they want to prove that capability 100 percent to the world. So when you have both sides being sort of so far apart, there just really isn't that impetus to talk yet. And Bruce Bennett, during the campaign in the U.S., Donald Trump had, you know, he'd made some different arguments about how the U.S. should engage with the world. Uh, but one of them was to sort of disengage from crises like these. And we have heard some interviews with some of his advisors who would like to see the U.S. sort of not engaging militarily or, or raising risks of, of, of confrontation there. Is it possible? I mean, is disengagement from this crisis, just pulling the troops out, is that sort of a viable strategy at this point? Well, it's, it's always a strategy that could be pursued. The question is, what are the consequences? If the consequences are that North Korea then invades South Korea and subjugates South Korea uh, with massive loss of life, uh, that is not an acceptable consequence. That would be a tremendous diminishment of American global stature. So uh, we have to be very careful with what we're trying to achieve here, what the consequences are of actions we could take. I think continuation of the alliance is the ideal outcome, uh, but the question is, how do we do that in the current circumstances? And Joshua Pollock, you know, we talked, Anki Panda talked briefly about the threat posed by North Korea sort of outside of nuclear weapons. Is that something that you see is something that can be sort of de-escalated? Tell us just a little bit about what North Korea's other capabilities are and how we might head those off. Well, they have a, a very extensive military. It's, it's uh, over a million men in arms is the usual estimate. But uh, nutrition is poor. Uh, logistics are poor. I have some real doubts about their ability to conduct an invasion, which is why I think Bruce mentioned WMD in this connection. Uh, they have uh, a rather extensive uh, long-range artillery setup. Uh, they have missiles of all ranges, so they would probably use striking power in any conflict in Korea, 
more than they would use uh, mobile warfare. And the payloads are conventional weapons, uh, probably a variety of chemical warheads uh, using chemical weapons like the one that was used against Kim Jong-un's late half-brother earlier this year in, in an airport in Malaysia. Uh, there are uh, said to be biological weapons, although it's, it's not clear if, if North Korea keeps those on hand or would try to produce them in the event of war. And of course, there are nuclear weapons of, of a variety of ranges. So they have many options and, and many tools. And Harry Kazianis, there have been some accusations thrown about that Kim Jong Un is sort of mentally unstable or isn't isn't operating sort of rationally in some way. What do you make of this? Does that is that does that sort of change how the U.S. thinks about negotiations? Well, well look, I, Kim Jong Un is is crazy like a fox because he is the head of a government that is. I mean, you could say whatever you want about it, but they have potentially a hundred thousand or more people in prison camps. I've had a chance to talk to North Korean defectors who who have left that country, and they've been through terrible ordeals, specifically if they've been in those type of camps. So yes, he is crazy for the regime that he is in control of. However, when you look at the things that he's done in order to to really write a bad hand that he has, you know, strategically versus the United States, he's gone out and built nuclear weapons, which, I mean. They are a terrible, and I, in my opinion, unusable weapon. But if you're trying to deter the United States, which is probably the world's most powerful military machine maybe ever, you need nuclear weapons to do that because you put the United States in a very terrible situation in South Korea as well with the losses that you would take by launching some sort of unilateral strike. So, on balance, that is a very rational sort of choice, you know. Um, I don't think he's particularly crazy. What I would suggest for everybody that's watching this program is to tune out all the, the tweets from President Trump and, tw and tune out the crazy statements from the North Koreans. Watch what both sides do. That's probably the clearest indicator of where this is going to go. Um, you know, we can get all sort of lost in the minutia of d dueling statements, locked and load, fire and fury, all this, all this funky stuff. But it's what the countries do that's ultimately going to set the stage, whether there's peace and war. And I think those are the best indicators above, above all else. And Bruce Bennett, our time does grow short with just about 30 seconds left. Is there any reason for optimism that things are going to get better or more stable over the next uh, two to three years? Uh, not a lot of reason for optimism, no. There are too many uh, challenges from the north uh, and too much difficulty finding a way of reining it in. Joshua Pollock? Uh, I'm not terribly optimistic either. I don't think that the two sides are prepared to talk to each other at this time. And Harry Kazianis, I'll give you the last word then. No, no. There's going to be more missile tests. There's going to be more nuclear tests. The North Koreans eventually could test a hydrogen bomb. This is going to be in the news for years. My fear is this accidental war more than anything else. That's going to have to do it for this edition of Global Journalist, a production of the Reynolds Journalism Institute and KBIA Mid-Missouri Public Radio. Our thanks to Ankit Panda, Bruce Bennett, Harry Kazianis, and Joshua Pollock for joining us. Our lead producer is Lauren Wortman, with visual editing from Rachel Foster Gimble. Pat Akers of KBIA is our audio engineer. Travis McMillan is director. For all of us at Global Journalist, I'm Jason McClure. Thanks for tuning in.